Uh, my name is Pramod Varma. I'm th I was the chief architect for Aadhaar. Uh, I have with me Raku, who has been a principal architect at uh, when we do the project at Aadhaar. Um, we are going to talk about more of the technology aspects today. It's a very long topic, and it's uh, one of the largest uh, projects uh, in the world, and largest identity system going to be largest identity system in the world. And uh, we can't talk about all the the benefits and the everything else today. So we will try to stick with the technology part because that's what you guys are here for. And we can uh, share with you how we built up the system from uh, scratch to go to 200 million people. Well, we have 200 million people in the database now and it's growing fast. Uh, do you want to just help me just go down? So I'm going to very quickly talk about, I think there is a, uh, it's important that uh, I give you a context of of where we are. So we, we are a country with 1.2 billion people and about 6 lakhs odd villages and uh, very important, some of the numbers, 60% live under $2 and only 3% pays tax. So all of you are part of the privileged 3% possibly. And we have less than 80, 20% uh, who do anything with banking. So it's, it's a kind of a complete uh, disparity. You can see that. And interestingly, we have 800 million mobile connections. So that's the only thing which I think we really took off like mad and everybody figured out. So I think uh, we underestimated people's ability to uh, use technology. That was a good thing. So I mean, people just use it once they see value in it. And we have uh, interesting, another interesting thing you see is about 200, 300 million people moving around in the country where a lot of immigrants, including a lot of us who are not necessarily from Bangalore, living here and working. It actually means that we have to constantly establish our identity. So we actually our government spends about 300,000 uh, crores, that's about 20, 40 billion dollars every year giving direct subsidies. But all the subsidies require identity. It's subsidies like salary, you know, NRE, GA wages, Janani Suracha Yojana for women, all kinds of pension for old age, artists, a lot of money going down. And it's like paying a set of people with not necessarily having unique identity. It's a massive money. And actually, we have a lot of, so many programs for the poor, uh, only so much percentage, about 30, 40 percentage leaks uh, by ghost identities and you know, uh, unknown identity, uh, non-existing identities, and actually duplicate identities, very common thing. And so the vision was to uh, create a common national identity. So we don't have a common national identity uh, across uh, for everyone. So we have PAN card, but I talked about we only have 10 percentage people in the country who have PAN card. Only per 3 percentage pays tax. So it's a, you know, we don't have an online thing. Election identity is the most common thing, but it's not really uh, used as an identity card of sort. And the idea was to create a biometric back because the, uh, the purpose was to solve the uniqueness. So you, uh, that's the challenge. So you, you, how do you uniquely distinguish a person from the other person? And names, address don't really uh, help. And also, sorry, you can, can go back a minute. Yeah, so uh, also interestingly, we, I think the uh, strategy was to create an identity platform. It's very critical that we, uh, the program doesn't take on all the features of identity uh, and the applications. So the applications are left to every one of you, right? Several of you writing applications in the cloud. Uh, people may be writing pension or school scholarship programs, uh, attendance systems, everything, or a banking system, financial systems, payment systems, where it requires an identity, establishing an identity, and verifying an identity all the time. We do that all the time by giving copy of PAN cards and everything else, right? So that's so what we wanted to create it with an open API. So the platform is an open platform with an API that's accessible to many applications. So if you guys start working, we still don't have the critical mass. We only have 200 million people. But once you get critical mass, you'll start seeing some of your application online may require, what's your other number? I'll verify you online, you know, immediately. And that becomes very valuable. Okay. So the other system is actually broken into two primary uh, modules, the application itself. One is the enrollment, which is a one-time in-person's life coming to Aadhaar system of any of the touch points in the ground, giving 
demographics data we have actually very minimal data that was one of the reasons for obvious privacy and everything it was just purpose was only to create an identity system and so we limited ourselves to name date of birth gender and address that's it and optionally we have mobile number and email mobile number is very common we do see people giving mobile number email we don't see at all and very 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 few people and biometrics so all the 10 fingers and iris so we take both multi model biometrics and what we do is actually to take that uh, uh, request from you to give an aadhar number it's a digital data encrypted data and we have to run through what's called a deduplication that's really the largest challenge taking your identity request and running through the entire system to ensure that you are indeed unique and actually give you a new aadhar number if you are unique and if you are not we politely tell you that you are already in the system and so you probably have a different number and don't stand in line several times you know it's not it doesn't make sense and authentication on the other hand is something which you use it all the time so once you get an aadhar number when you walk into a bank somebody walking into today aadhar number is actually accepted as a bank opening um, kyc requirement so know your customer requirement and you can get a sim card and so on so people find it very valuable to people who have no identity go with aadhar and say uh, i am who i am i am pramod and how does the system verify my identity claim that's what the authentication all about so authentication is a very very lightweight open api which can be used by applications you guys write to verify someone's identity claim it can be on the internet it can be on a device it can have five fingerprint it can be otp based so we allow multiple things yeah and yeah go ahead please thank you uh, and from when we actually let me go down to technology very quickly like your 40 minutes is very little to talk about the system but when we started doing this together it's it's the largest largest project and we wanted to ensure that we uh, as an arch as architecture team we put together a set of principles design principles by which we will design the whole system and some of them are one was designed for scale obvious reasons we are 1.2 billion people and you know in the in february when we were doing deduplication we had 18 crore that's 180 million people in the database so we were doing about 180 trillion biometric matches every day so we had to do a lot of compute and that's a, it's a pretty large compute and it goes to larger database the more compute you're going to do because to find out your unique or not of course there are filters smart filters you apply to reduce the matching set to a much smaller number to so the uh, the compute is still very large and authentication on the other hand if even 10% of the country is authenticated every day we are talking 100 million people 100 million authentications every day so 100 million api calls and maybe 200 million 500 million uh, api calls so scale was very very important and the next one the next uh, architecture principles if you can move down once uh, it was open architecture i think government project i think it was very critical for us to uh, bring in openness for multiple reasons one was openness because of the uh, it's it's a very large program we wanted to be vendor neutral and we didn't want to use one of the proprietary technologies and so on so we stuck with open source so these principles were like written down like you know bible and we everything we chose we talked we look back and say does it adhere to this principle one was open standards to ensure interoperability so we actually used almost all standards or if you don't find we created so we have bunch of standards for biometric uh, ca data capture biometric device interoperability which in the country world nobody had done it so far because most of the time people used to just choose a vendor and say okay i'm going to use your technology and go with it so actually we had to define this api publish it on our website it's all on our website uh, where multiple developers and multiple vendors can actually you know comply to that api so that we have a choice to make from we are not stuck with one technology vendor sort of thing and use of open source open source is a very very powerful thing and that's, that's i think reiterated everywhere we, we are talking about all the talks 
So it is very critical that open source gives us a power of you know, the flexibility, openness, and actually a lot of from the security, which is the next topic. The open source also helps security a lot, especially when it's a government program. It's very, very important to know that what's going in to the system is absolutely open and everybody, you know, millions of developers like you are actually looking into it and ensuring that's an open system and there's no malware and, you know, hidden codes and anything else. It was very, very critical. And also the data security was most important for us and it's biometric and personal data. So, you know, entire system from capture, from the time of capture on the field, in the villages, in memory, we encrypt using PKI, and the entire system throughout the disk, it's all encrypted data. So we had some limitation in compute because we couldn't just crawl through and do text searching and things like that because it was all heavily encrypted data. But hey, we had to balance, you know, what's, what's security versus what's better for architecture. And uh, data privacy, so if you can move on. So, and this, on the design for scale, I want to talk about today because of the big day, you know, this particular conference about scale. And one of the architecture principles we said is we have to use scale out. So we are not going to, we are not going to get ourselves into the scale up architecture every, any, any place. That actually means that I'm not going to buy a component or a single database or anything. Then I expect the database to solve my computing problem. That's a bad idea. And 20 years plus I've been doing architecture. It's just not the right th approach to take at all. You should say computing has to be outside the data store. So we had to make sure every pieces of the puzzle was a scale out. So we could add more nodes, we could add more uh, servers, and we could scale. Not by buying a big box. You know, the problem is all the annual maintenance contracts, everything else is once you buy into that, you, you can't get off. So it's very, very critical that you use what's called commodity hardware. So we, were, we completely run on com commodity hardware. Simple Linux boxes, 64-bit, blade servers, we buy just cheap blade servers, plug it in, and the architecture actually scales. So we can actually scale up very, very, very linearly. And including the data store, I think the fourth point is very critical. A lot of application, I think uh, Ashok just talked about that, you know, you always see this bottleneck finally uh, at the database side. It was very critical for us to ensure that databases by day one onwards designed in the application to take care of sharding and linear scalability, horizontal scalability. And the next, move forward please. And no single point of bottleneck. It is very critical as an architect to look for and saying, if I break any of the system components, will it stop working? Will it stop working? How do I make sure that every component's redundancy Data redundancy, compute redundancy, two different things. Lot of people actually completely mix up with compute and data. Data stores are dummy data stores. You should use whether RDBMS, Hadoop, uh, any data store, HPS, whatever you're using, you should be using it as a dump store. You should actually take compute out. That actually makes it easy because that way you are you are not expecting database to solve S through SQL all your business problems. You are expecting you're building it from your you know principal point of view, building it from scratch outside. And things fail. I think it's very, very important that we will reiterate hundred of times. Everything fails. Everything fails from software, in, when it goes production, from blade servers, we have a few thousand blade servers, I mean, probably 20,000 cores plus. Uh, it just burns. So servers burn, storage die. So you have to expect failure. So how do you architect components that is built to fail? Built, not built to fail, built to handle failure. Okay, so built to handle failure from a outside. So that is something which an application has to handle. You cannot expect somehow your vendor or a product to give you failure handling. It's a bad idea to even think of that way. And asynchronous, asynchronous processing. Just separate as much as possible through multiple steps of repeatable, retriable, pieces of the puzzle. And item potency, I think Ashok ta talked about item potency, is very key. All our components are built as item potent. That means if it fails, no problem. We can start from where we live, we can retry, and you do compensating transactions and so on. So you compensate if something has gone wrong. So that's uh, handled in the application level. And just to give you a volume before I hand over to uh, Reku, the volumes we are talking about, we, our target goal was 600, 800 million 
UIDs or Aadhaar numbers in four years. We are pretty smoothly cruising towards that. We wanted to hit one million a day and within a year, so we hit one million. So from October last year, we have been actually doing one million enrollments a day into the database. So every day we get one million people to process and give Aadhaar number. And the, as the database grow up, goes up, the compute keeps going up. So we had to continue to scale without architectural rewrite. That was very critical. And in February, March time, we were doing about 200 trillion biometric matches every day. And interestingly, each of the enrollment packet we get, it's five megabytes because of biometric and it's encrypted. So it's actually five megabytes with lots of metadata. So the size was very, very tricky for us. Even on the villages, right? you're collecting this data in villages and it, you had to transport that much of data and it was not an online transfer. You can't put a data card and expect you know, hundreds of people on 5 MB every day to come into our data center. Just not have the connectivity of that large scale. So we had to do all kinds of offline data collection mechanism, but still ensuring security. So the data is heavily encrypted, signed, and so on, but it, it takes time to get to us. And we get about 1 million a day means, you know, 5 terabytes. That's what incremental data we get. And we, every day we process about 30 terabyte of I.O. in the data center today. That's what we do. And of course, lifecycle updates, you know, address changes, as you grow, and that, that continues forever, and new births probably will continue forever. I think knowing, our, I think we might peak our population, but I think new births, we have about 70,000 births a day or something like that, okay? And additional process data, we have lots of process data. We have, we, our architecture, we were extremely high on metadata. So we collected so much of metadata about the system from the enrollment, so we knew which operator is doing what, which operators spend how much time on what part of the screen, on every time, on villages, by people, by machines. We knew how much. So all that process data, and it's lovely for people who love data, <laughs> it's like awesome, because it's just, it has no personal data. It is just process data knowing how many people tend to correct their name several times, and how many people spend a lot of time in the demographic field versus uh, biometric capture. Everything is captured and we could measure them and we give continuous feedback through our portal to our operators. So every operator knows how they are doing in comparison with other operators. And it was very, and actually helps. The moment you tell the people, tell people that how you are doing with other people, natural. I think people tend to uh, improve themselves by knowing it. And go, go on. And authentication on the other hand is a very tricky thing. Very different problems, okay. Enrollment it's a large file, 5 MB encrypted data, comparing with everyone to find the du du duplicate. Whereas, and that's a throughput problem because people are not waiting. By the way, uh, we don't give real time Aadhaar numbers. So we collect the data, several days later you get kind of Aadhaar, right? Sometimes you have delays and all that thing. So it's a batch kind of a throughput problem. Authentication is a uh, yes or no uh, live call. So that is the online service we have offered to authentication user agencies such as banks and they can subscribe to that service and when the u resident comes and say I am Pramod and I put my fingerprint, it's system can tell you, yeah, that resident's claim of identity claim is right. You can never ask what's Pramod's address, I mean, there's only a yes or no. So if Pramod claims I, my, I live in Bangalore, you can verify, the bank can verify. It's a one-way verification. And that's a sub-second problem, you know, we have to respond in sub-seconds and we are currently sized for 100 million authentications a day and all of them require guaranteed audit. So that was a little tricky for us that the system had to do a right commit, uh, com guaranteed rights of that volume and because the uh, non-repudiability, you can't go back and say I didn't authenticate. So you, we needed digital signature, our, our API is out there, you can actually look at it. We have at least few thousand developers developing applications based on these APIs. Uh, we have a Google group to discuss and all that thing. And it's very tricky to ex uh, get guaranteed audits there. So we had to, and it, it is multi-DC architecture. That actually means that if a meteor strikes on one of the data center, you still had to guarantee the data is in the other data center. So you had to do a near data center uh, data preservation of audit and so on. So we, we, we'll t he'll talk about part of that, how we implement it. And size is very small. Authentication requires, unlike enrollment, it's only 4K, including the digital signature. So very small, 
very lightweight, stateless. It's very critical that we did stateless because we could load balance across data centers, any data centers. And, but, you know, the, because of the volume, the re number of audit records just grows crazy. And so we need to do mechanism to actually ensure that our data structures are uh, allowed, allowing that. And we also have analytics. The entire system has subs and going, all the metadata I talked about goes into our analytics module on Hive. We'll talk about some of that. And that Hadoop system, which is actually doing analytics, has no personal data. It's completely anonymized data going into analytics, but we get, you know, summary data. We, you know how many people in that age group actually are doing authentication and so on. So we understand the summary level um, measures. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And these are the open APIs we had done. Core authentication API, uh, best finger detection API, one-time PIN, OTP. So if you are on the internet, you don't have to use biometric, you can use one-time PIN if you have a mobile in, in the system and biometric device APIs and biometric SDK APIs and so on. So these are all APIs which are published on our website and a lot of developers working on it. I'll let uh, Reku go uh, talk to you about some other implementation and we'll come back and conclude. All right, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll. You want to take So I'll uh, try to translate some of uh, what we discussed as principles to running code and and in that I would uh, try to make it relevant so that each of you can take back uh, what learnings we had and hopefully assign or try to uh, apply some of these to uh, programming patterns and, and, and challenges that, that you face. So on the, if you see from principles, right, so on the Enrollment and the authentication side, we, if you translate that to kind of workloads, the enrollment is a kind of asynchronous, very batch oriented uh, workload where no user is waiting on it. On the other hand, the authentication is a kind of a workload where someone is, is waiting for it. So it's a very synchronous workload. Now, you take these workloads and then we see how to translate some of the principles that we established into patterns and map it to technologies that we can use, right? So uh, if you take to uh, on the principal side, so we said we wanted to have very lightweight application development, so which is plain old Java objects. So we wanted to write each of our components as plain classes and be able to manage and run them. Uh, lightweight custom application container. Now, the workloads that we had and the kind of system that we are trying to build did not fit any of the conventional application enterprise applications and contrary to what many of the vendors were trying to sell these big app servers, we decided to build our application containers uh, to be very lightweight and, and custom build them. So uh, with respect to choice of technology, so we said, hey, we don't need even J2E. So we, we picked Java, but we said we don't need J2E, so we would build our servers using the Java 2 standard edition. And to manage the runtime, we said we would use Spring. Uh, so when we also needed HTTP gateway, so if you take the authentication API, the last mail uh, is on HTTP, so we wanted an HTTP gateway and we had multiple choices, so we picked one which was Tomcat. Compute patterns, uh, again here we uh, decided we had to move away from the conventional, uh, you know, the design patterns that are there uh, of saying that typically you take data and move it into the application layer. Uh, instead, we, we saw it, uh, it would be relevant to move compute to the, the data layer. So data locality patterns and also to be able to distribute uh, compute across a number of machines and here make a choice or give the ability to say, is it cheaper to move uh, processing or is it cheaper to move data? Okay. So uh, in order to distribute compute across uh, processes and within a process, uh, we used Okay, so we used uh, compute architectures like SEDA, SEDA which stands for Stage Driven Driven Architecture, and here we used uh, a combination of Mule and, and RabbitMQ, okay, where RabbitMQ gives us the, the messaging layer, and Mule gives us a programming model which allows us to sequence a number of steps, 
across machines or to run multiple of these steps in, in parallel within the same uh, uh, JVM process. Okay, master worker. Now, while Hadoop gives us, if you take raw uh, storage, gives us uh, ability to do master worker and you know the, the job tracker and task tracker uh, uh, setup, it also uh, suffers from high latencies, right? Because it's, it's constantly writing data, intermediate data to the disk, shuffling data, and then uh, use between the map and uh, reduce phases. But for workloads like the authentication workload, where our total response time had to be in the order of milliseconds, we could not afford this latency. So we wanted another master worker pattern, which was not very uh, disk and IO bound, and for which we used uh, grid gain. So data access types. So we had different kinds of uh, data access patterns or data access needs, if you were to call it. The first was high throughput streaming read, right? So when you're doing the deduplication process, so four terabytes of data coming into the system, being read about four to five times in a day, so it's about 25 or 30 terabytes of I.O. per day. So that's very high throughput streaming, which is used in BioDay Group and in the analytics uh, side of a system. So where we used uh, HDFS, and, and for the analytics, we use Hive. The other is high volume, moderate latency, which is like the workflow. So if you take the enrollment, it goes through a number of stages, and we kind of checkpoint intermediate stage, and then the data post other generation goes into a, a, a store, a data store, which is asset compliant, reliable, durable, you know, gives you the transactionality. So we use MySQL for that, and uh, cases where we use for authentication, we, we kind of use a cache database uh, that's built on HBase. The next category is very high volume, very low latency. This is, uh, these are needs like authentication, demographic dedupe, where you, you have the ability to, as an additional uh, step in the process, dedupe a resident based on key demographic information, uh, provide search capability, uh, and also a KYC kind of an API, and uh, that's built on top of uh, MongoDB as a data store and, and Solar for storing secondary indexes. Now I'll just pause a minute here uh, just to give you a dump of, uh, so that you can digest the fact, uh, the various technologies and what they were mapped to and what purpose uh, they were actually chosen for. So if you have any questions here, uh, we can take before I move further. Okay, there's a question there. Okay, the, we did a benchmark of 10 million authentication requests in 10 hours. So a million an hour. So this, like I said, yeah, so, the, uh, so when I said that was a benchmark, so the live coming in is a few thousands. Because the uh, focus, right, if you see the the lot of focus on the enrollment side, which is 200 million, so authentication systems are picking up. Okay. Okay. Can so you please just repeat the question? Can you just repeat the question? Sorry. Just repeat his question. Yeah. Uh, so the question he asked was, uh, where is personal information stored? Correct. Right. So uh, the master data, like Pramod said, is encrypted and it is stored on the file system. Okay. Uh, extracts, the demographic extracts of it and the UID record is stored in a MySQL database. So if you say the UID data post other generated record that's stored in MySQL. We'll move on. Okay, so one of the challenges uh, aside of compute that we faced was about uh, uh, various data stores and the kind of data consistency challenges that, that we have, right? So if you take the enrollment uh, packet, so which are, uh, it's about 5 MB in size, for the, during the time that it's being processed, there is a requirement for very high uh, throughput, read throughput uh, and streaming rights. And subsequent to it, we need to archive this data for, for seven years. And in systems like Hadoop, the, the challenge is you also dedicate a lot of compute for associated with storage. So when we sized it, for in order to store a petabyte of data in archive, we would probably need about 200 servers. And we couldn't afford to deploy so much of compute for data which is rarely going to be read. So 
we had to create an archive store and the archive store is on NFS giving moderate uh, read throughput, uh, pretty high latency read, right. Uh, the next for in process or hot data, the data is stored in, in HDFS. So that gives us high read throughput uh, also but at a cost of latency. Um, but on top of HDFS again for selective data like biometric templates, we store it in HBase, so which can give us high read throughput but at acceptable uh, latency. And then uh, the MySQL data store, uh, our own experience says that it's, it's not a no, it's not a debate between NoSQL versus SQL or, you know, relational versus unstructured. Uh, we have had multiple instances of data loss possible from the NoSQL stores, even though they, they claim to have multiple copies. So if there was one store that we could trust the data, and there is two pieces of data that we cannot afford to lose. One is the, the raw packet, which we store in the NFS, and the other is the Aadhaar record after it has been generated. So this Aadhaar record, along with a number of uh, other information like address and, and things like that is stored in MySQL. Uh, I mean, any RDBMS would have been fine, but use uh, MySQL. So, uh, relatively low, lat lat low latency for uh, index reads, uh, very importantly, giving us asset properties for storing the data. Yeah. Uh, Mongo, uh, we use it for search uh, and other characteristics over, uh, again, lower latency. And Solar, uh, again, uh, for giving us fast access. So in all of this, if you see, while we did create multiple data stores, we deal with the data consistency issues, right? What could be uh, live in your, uh, not in an NFS, but maybe in MySQL with, with respect to status of an enrollment may not necessarily be immediately reflected in the, in the Mongo layer. So that's something uh, to watch out for. Uh, on the architecture side, uh, so like I said, two di distinct workloads, uh, enrollment side, uh, using SEDA messaging, giving us ability to scale across a number of uh, nodes. Uh, we maintain soft state, and that soft state is, is very relevant for us to uh, enable recovery. So it means any node could go down, and when it comes back, it could go and retry those transactions uh, supported through item potency. Um, authentication side, uh, essentially an HTTP gateway, R lots more simpler from a workload standpoint, but uh, giving us uh, I mean, where we had to provide for low latency processing. So in, in, in this, what we also did is all the systems are, are continuously emitting a lot of interesting events. And these events could be monitoring events, could be uh, BI events, and we take these events and deliver them to relevant data stores. You will see that our entire analytics uh, data is fed through these uh, events which are emitted by the system. And the same events are also used for uh, real-time monitoring of the system. Which, is, which takes me to my next slide. So in order to operationalize all of this, now this is a, a live screen grab of, uh, yeah, the live screen grab of uh, the NOC, uh, the operations monitoring, uh, the NOC tool or the network operation center. We have this SLA monitoring dashboard, which tells us what does it take for the system to continue to do a million others a day. And now the system behind this, so you're talking about 20,000 cores, Right? But at a business SLA level, we want to be doing, uh, the, if you see the right corner there, you see like on that day it was doing uh, 5 lakh 74,000 other generated till that point in time, the kind of throughput that's happening, the various stages that are there in the queue and where the uh, various bottlenecks are. So the point I want to leave behind is all this big data is nice, but in order to operationalize them, you really need monitoring systems. Right? And you can't throw people at at solving this issue, but at least to see the health of your system, you really need uh, these large uh, monitoring systems. So for learning, I'll uh, give it to Pramod. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, summary slide. Uh, pretty much learning is that, uh, again, as he said, it's not a no SQL, SQL. I, I think it's a, you know, a wrong way to um, argue about. I think there is a purpose for each of them. You have to choose the technology for the purpose of it. And you have to understand what the value is coming from. And the maturity cycles are very, maturity curves where they are are very different. So we have had some bad experiences, losing data and all that thing. But it's very critical that you choose data stores, data stores especially, that are uh, knowing what the flaws are. And then you can work around it, no, no issue at all. 
Actually, you can work around the flaws of HBase or Hadoop and actually do it in the application layer and recovery and uh, any retries and so on. You get the great scale, no problem at all. But some data you can't. So, so some of that learning is very critical. And we want to just walk through a few things we could pick, there are a lot more maybe. One of them is make API based. I think it's obvious to a lot of developers, but when we write it, we, it's very tricky or we don't know what we are writing. So I write everything as components because some things we rewrite, we probably rewrote four or five times, I think. We throw away and write. So problem was the regression, right? You had to make sure that everything is small, componentized, write an API, write test, test suite for that API, knowingly that you rewrite multiple times, okay? And everything fails. I mean, this is an experience. And even Hadoop, doesn't matter what you choose. Everything fails. MySQL come down. Blade servers burn. Storage all just scraps out all over the place. And it's when you large compute, 2,000, thousands of machines. And we have 2.5 petabytes of data already. And it's, it's just bound to happen. And the question you're asked as an application developer is that do you depend on some uh, technology to somehow recover your data and s probably not. That's a bad idea. So you have to plan for that advance. So architecturally, you have to think through system must recover, retry transactions, sort of self-heal, and start thinking building that way. And security and privacy, it's not an afterthought, especially for us. I think this project called for very heavily, and a lot of you guys probably building cloud services with resident data, uh, I think you will reach a situation where, uh, you know, the government rules and the compliance and all that thing will come in. And you have to be think about it from day one, okay? And scalability does not come from one product. Right? Scalability does not come free either. I think you have to think about it. Every component you write, you have to think about how you're going to write, how you're going to scale. And uh, the good thing is that a lot of technologies in the open source available today to make your life a lot easier. So I think that, that is much better 10, 15 years ago. But you have to still think about how you're going to architect. Uh, open scalar, I think if, if you think, if you assume uh, homogeneity, and if you assume that everything is come from one product or one vendor, and it, then you have a problem. So you have to think that everything is going to be heterogeneous. You're going to have a bunch of all kinds of technologies in it. Then the question is, how do you interoperate them? Interoper make it interoperable and knowingly and using com commodity computing. So if you are on the cloud, you already on a computing, commodity computing. And for us, we were not on the public cloud. We are on a private cloud, on our own data center. So we had to choose something which is uh, assuming that we get best product from the market at any time. So that actually means that we don't assume any vendors, any product at all. We buy cheapest available at that time. Okay? I think that's pretty much it. So thank you so much. I don't know whether we have we can time for questions. Yeah, questions. Especially if you're not hungry. And you guess it's lunch time, right? Yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the amount of data that's being stored is about 5 MB and that the API lookups are only 4K. So if I'm doing like a retina scan, how do you get that data? And oh, yeah, that's, so that's, that's how biometrics work. Uh, the, what happens is the biometric images, ten, which, which, which are captured for your finger, so the whole ten, five finger, five finger, uh, four finger, four finger, and thumbs. Uh, those are images. They are high quality, uh, very heavy images. Uh, the biometric system converts them into a, a unique uh, kind of a signature. Okay. It's called a minutia. So you convert into a minutia, and then you store the minutia. So minutia are much smaller. So that goes in MySQL? Uh, no, actually, no. So minutia we extract. Uh, see, the, minutia, the actual data is encrypted and stored. Minutia is extractable anytime. So what we do is it's used only for authentication when you do biometric matches. So it goes in during deduplication. It goes into deduplication engine's database. But authentication is on edge base. So we have, and authentication is always based on your Aadhaar number. So our authentication API, Aadhaar number is mandatory field. That's like a one is to one match. So you go and say, I, my Aadhaar number is this, and I am Pramod. So I can put my fingerprint and verify my claim. I, I had one other question. Um, so what did you guys do in terms of like, um, how did you think through stuff like identity theft? And, um, you know, because I, knowing how the security stuff works, you know, yeah. it's obviously important. So I was just wondering what you guys did. Too. There are, uh, I mean, that. obviously, if, I, I'm not sure whether we can chat during the lunch too, if you want. But there are a lot of aspects about the biometric itself 
uh, the fuzzy matching and how biometric, multi-model biometric helps towards that as well as a constant fraud detection engine. So you have to con we run a fraud detection behind the scene using the, we have an inline fraud detection as well as offline. So we actually run that constantly to figure out, but interestingly, we don't actually, s in our country is maybe, you know, s so far uh, different pattern of people. I think people stand, we see trivial duplicates. Most of the time, because you start a counter, everybody stands in line, and then you start another enrollment center, every same guy stand in line again, because they think there's some government stuff going on. I don't want to miss out. Every one of my friends standing around, so I'm standing. So we see what's called a trivial duplicate, not necessarily trying to beat the system. Okay, but that might come in the future, though. As it evolves, it might come. So, but it's, it's an evolving thing. So you have to constantly catch up with that. I think. Yeah, my question is related to the enrollment. Uh, first thing you talked about the biometric data. So here I wanted to know the percentage of failure, occurrence of failure. And second thing, exactly uh, how are you defining this failure? As you just said, you're taking the respective thumbprints and uh, eye scans and say out of this, even if uh, one of the images, because I do have read about this in the newspaper where they had said at certain level some of the images were not printed correctly or that was not taken so the entire account would have been considered as a failure or how was it okay so I think um, I definitely don't have time to talk about a lot of biometrics but the good thing to answer your question we have a white paper published on our website uidia.gov.in is called use of biometrics in Aadhaar system very detailed. It tells you exactly how we're using it, what are the accuracy numbers we, we are getting it, and how are you doing what's called a failure to capture, which is what you talked about. So we have a failure to capture, how are we handling failure to capture. The multimodality helps towards that, iris and fingerprint, so one of them we can deduplicate if other one is not there. We are people with no fingers, for example, right? We have to deal with all that thing. And the idea is to not have enrollment, no, ca we have to, the goal of the system is inclusion. So we have to give identity to everyone, even if it means exception processing. So do read through that white paper. Okay? There's a lot more biometric details there. Maybe Hi. last question, I think, before. Yeah. Mind. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to know a little more around the deployment monitoring uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, because we are doing recommendation engine for early job seekers in India. So if you just imagine the number of people who graduate every year and seeking job opportunities right out of college. So that's the scale which we are looking at. And recently we have started growing exponentially. And uh, I realized that deployment monitoring is one crucial factor to determine the health of your system. So I'd like to know more around the deployment monitoring infrastructure you, you guys are using. Requirement monitoring? Deployment. Deployment monitoring. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, if he, uh, he talked about that. N assuming that uh, if you start, if you as an application developer, if you assume your operators, who are 24 by 7 monitoring your system are intelligent enough to deal with your application, you're wrong. Actually, we it just can't work. So the system has to push it out or out very, very, very quickly and that what's going on and try to even not even expect the people to fix that issue. I think a lot of times we have done every one of our component, for example, if it fails, completely retries by itself. So there is no need for anyone to really lose sleep over unless it's repeatedly failing, okay? So, so what we did was on the uh, network monitoring side, we use the, the screen you saw is actually built on HTML5, very simple, browser-based. What we do is from the application nodes, we have what's called an in-memory uh, event collector. So we wrote ourselves a code. Uh, we didn't use any actually uh, technology. Actually, we had a pattern. In fact, uh, we'll be publishing some of that very soon. Uh, so what we we, do, we did is uh, collect all the events in memory, and we knowingly that it's okay to lose few events, and the in memory collector kind of a singleton pattern for every node. It published onto a dashboard server. So we had a REST API which we built a dashboard server. So on the side, this was actually collecting the data. And the, the monitoring, this, this refreshed off that uh, REST API server. We do, we use Nagios, we use Nagios for infra infrastructure monitoring. So Nagios is used for infrastructure monitoring, but if you look at this, this a business guy, our CEO or our chairman, Nandan Nilikani can walk in and say exactly what's going on. No technology involved in this, in the sense that the way you articulated this is actually completely a business 
person's view. So we have reviews right on in front of this saying that how come we have a so, so low rate. Every terminology used here in the screen, for example, are completely non-technology terminology, the business tech terminology. How many enrollments, how many held, how many didn't held, and all that thing. And each of those boxes can be, you know, opened up. So this had to be custom built. We use NAS US for all the standard infra, like a network components, MySQL, of course we use that. Yeah. We use so what's infra. your availability target for the system? Who's asking? What's your availability target for the system? Availability target uh, for um, authentication is actually four nines and probably going towards five nines, but uh, we are around maybe 98 percentage of time uh, on authentication. Enrollment is actually, because it's a batch oriented system, we have a little more of a luxury there. So, you know, the system can come up, go down, but as long as we get a throughput of one million a day, we don't have any backlog. That's all we care. So I think that that's probably around 96, 97 percentage. Yeah. So, so, okay, I think we had the, so held the mic. Over the next couple of years, you can expect that we'll have better technologies yeah. to handle many things. Uh, how how will those get plugged in, or how will the, how will the system evolve? So I think that actually goes back to my earlier saying that first of all, we have tried to build everything as a comp component. Very, very, very simple, uh, mostly API based. Even if we didn't have an API, we wrote a persistence layer. For example, you, get, you know, you, get, you can catch up with them during lunch. We wrote a persistence layer which actually completely transparently uh, allowed us to shift from MySQL to Mongo without any code change. So, which allow, so we think, at least all the experience we have, we believe that we have done it in a very small, loosely coupled in a component fashion so that we can rewrite components of the thing and evolve. It's very tricky, it's very tricky to leave it open because we have to solve a business problem today. So we have to kind of completeness is required, but loose coupling and API probably the be you know, two things you can keep in mind, I think. Hi, uh, if a person dies, uh, how long the data will be retained or how the process okay, of... The current policy is to retain forever. So the data after 100 years, it will be huge, right? Yeah, we don't know 100 years later what the policy is going to be. But for now, uh, it's only small data. One billion is not big number. I think you guys are all talking big data. So one billion doesn't, nobody seems to be blinking these days. Uh, so we'll keep it. Supposedly, a uh, world's population peaks at 11 billion or something. So it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, but we'll probably figure out 50 years later. It'll be good to watch. Yeah. I think. Last one. No. Uh, actually, see, it's very important. Our purpose was very, 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 very minimalistic. It was extremely important to keep it ex damn simple to get a system right. And that actually means that we don't want to know your relationship, whether you're married, how many wives you have, or we don't care about any of that, right? We care about you as an individual identity. You are authenticatable. Applications, on the other hand, in the system, like your banking application, they care. Your healthcare applications, you know, those applications will care. Identity system, we don't have to know for now, but we do have a thing where to somebody can report dead death. No, but our death reporting in this country is not clean at all. So it, I think it will have to evolve a little. For now, we just mark if it's dead reported and it gets authenticated, we just know. No, actually we, actually we don't think so. We don't think, you know, cutting down the number of database records is going to make any difference because the architecture is such a way that, uh, you know, very little difference between a key lookup. So we are doing a completely key lookup, right? So very little difference. So I, I, we are not losing sleep over it. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Uh, on one question. Yeah. All right. Uh, what, what are the types of uh, private, uh, private uh, uh, you know, usage of this information? Obviously, government uh, agencies will be using it. Yeah. But what are the private? Uh, no, actually, we have. Uh, so I think I, I really encourage you to visit uidea.gov.in. We have some nice white paper, white paper about articulating the usage. For example, uh, career site he talked about, or you know, HR systems. At the end of the day, it's identity. And Aadhaar number should be considered like a root identity. So when you're born, you, know, you get an identity, and every other identity are what's called a derived identity. So the, your PAN card system uh, provides you an identity for a domain, or a driver's license provides you a de derived identity. Today we have nothing which is unifying them, and hence 
is a problem with complete duplication, fake everything else, right? So Aadhaar is not necessarily it's just a, just an identity. Use it use for uh, as a root identity that other identities can work well. So you can actually think of any system. Today, you walk in school admission, you know, school programs, pension programs, anything requiring constantly people have to claim and you have to prove who you are. And that, that's a constant problem. And with immigrant labor, the 300 million people who are moving around, people who, they, don't, they never walk alone in the road and all that because it's very tricky for them. They can't establish their identity. Uh, so they always move in, they get caught by police and all that. You know, it's not a. It's, so identity is a very simple, who you are, that's it. And that's all we do. Actually, by the way, this system knows zero knowledge of transactions you conduct in life. So this is a zero knowledge transaction. All we do is identity and we can verify online. Very simple. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. Thank you, Raghunath.